Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and board game aficionado. Welcome to Rogue Watson Reviews, my video review series where I take a look at tabletop games. Now these videos are divided into three parts. First, I'll introduce the game, take a look at the components, and briefly explain how it plays. Second, I'll run through a sample turn or round of the game, and finally, I'll list my pros and cons and provide my final thoughts. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons Andrew, Brian, Richard, and Joe. And gold patrons, RPG Paper Crafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy and Yuma, Marcos, David, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, a.k.a. Cert 2 b Adam, Dead Lizard, Lounge, and Alkshi. Thank you all for your support. With this video, we're going to be taking a look at Keyforge, Call of the Archons. Keyforge is a collectible card game. Sort of. I'll get to that in a bit. Designed by Richard Garfield of Magic the Gathering fame, and many great card and board games over the years. Like Magic, it's designed for two players playing head-to-head -head with decks full of monsters and artifacts, but unlike just about every other CCG, there's no resource system, and you don't customize your deck at all. Instead, Keyforge has coined a new term, Unique Deck Game. So picture a CCG, but without booster packs and only starter decks. But every single one of those starter decks is randomly generated by an algorithm ensuring that one, no two decks are exactly alike, and two, every deck is technically viable and playable. This system is a breath of fresh air for those of us who enjoy CCG gameplay but are less enthusiastic about dropping hundreds of dollars on booster packs. It also helps that the game is really, really fun. But first, uh, let's take a look and see what's inside the box. Now when I say take a look at the box, I mean the $40 starter set for Keyforge Call of the Archons, which you technically don't even need to play the game. You can actually just pick up a $10 deck, and assuming your opponent has one or you're picking up two for both of you, then you can play right out of there. But we're going to take a look at the starter box, which mine has been modified. I've had to take out the insert because I've obviously purchased a lot of decks for this game. And I know you're going to be horrified when I first open this up because you're going to see the dreaded rubber bands and I do apologize for this this is a temporary solution but uh, as you can see one of my primary complaints about the game which I hate to start off is that when you purchase a Keyforge uh, deck which is this is what it looks like this is not a reusable tuck box uh, you have to kind of destroy this box in order to get the deck inside which is super egregious that a game all about purchasing decks uh, would not have reusable tuck boxes so that's a big bummer so I've had to use some temporary solutions for now until I can get some uh, either tuck boxes or some kind of a uh, container. If you have any uh, suggestions, do let me know in the comments, however, because obviously I don't like using rubber bands uh, any more than you do. So the starter box initially comes with two starter decks, which are uh, Radiant Argus the Supreme and Miss Onyx Sensorius. The pre-made decks are the same for everyone, and they are built with simpler, more straightforward cards. Uh, it also comes with two random deck boxes and then several status cards and tokens, which you can see over here. Now these decks, they're really great teaching tools. They're also just solid, powerful decks uh, amongst themselves. But there is the caveat that it's a bit less exciting to play decks that everyone can technically have access to. But I do recommend the starter box because these do make really, really great teaching tools. Uh, they're just kind of easier decks to run. doesn't necessarily make them less fun, though. And now to help bring a bit of excitement, two random deck boxes are included, uh, which is a $20 value, meaning you get four decks for your 40 bucks, plus you get your cards and your tokens. So the starter deck is, uh, the starter box is definitely recommended, assuming you can get it at that MSRP price. Now the beauty of this system is that every deck is immediately playable. You're not even supposed to customize and change them, even if you wanted to. Also included are cards that denote the chain system, which is a... Uh, it's used on certain cards. There's a little counter that you put on there, which you draw less cards uh, as you go. And also a way to handicap uh, more powerful decks, because some decks just may be more powerful than others. It also gives you cards to denote uh, stun status effects, as well as any additional powers. I would have preferred tokens rather than these cards. And in fact, with the next Keyforge uh, bundle that's releasing, uh, I believe, soon, within maybe a month or two, uh, the, the next... Uh, one after Call of the Archons, is coming with tokens instead of cards. So I'm not alone in thinking that. Finally, the starter set comes with tokens for the amber that you'll be generating, the keys that you'll be forging, and some damage counters. Now, unlike just about every other head-to-head -head card game in existence, Keyforge isn't about defeating your opponent or reducing their HP. Instead, it's a race to be the first to forge three keys, which are 
these things, the big ones, right there. You need to generate seven amber to forge a key. So the game is less of a monster brawl and more of an engine builder, although some decks certainly lean towards constant battling. Now many cards will generate amber simply by playing them, while others have various actions or effects that grant amber. You need to start your turn with seven amber to forge a key, giving your opponent a chance to steal or capture amber on their turn. Look at one of these. So not for spoilery reasons, we'll look at one of these um, starter uh, deck lists, and you can see there's a nice little component list with every single deck you get will come with one of these. Every deck consists of these three factions, and there are seven factions total. Uh, there are only four different kinds of cards in Keyforge. There are actions, there are creatures, there are upgrades and artifacts, which both of those are way more rare compared to creatures and actions. There's an upgrade. Um, let's see if I can find an artifact. Maybe not. I don't remember this one. They should all have at least one or two artifacts, and maybe I already went through it. There we go. There's an artifact. Library of Babel. Now, a creature's power is both its attack and its hit points. You can see right there, and the Raiding Knight also has armor. Uh, and like Hearthstone, damage carries over between battles. Now, creatures could also have armor and taunt, and every creature can simply take the Reap action to generate additional amber. As I mentioned before, there are seven factions in Call of the Archons with each deck, including exactly three of them. Now, there's no resource system at all in Keyforge. Instead, on your turn, you declare which faction or house that you're going to play that turn. That becomes your active house. And then you can only play and use cards from that active house. It's a really brilliant system that's super easy to teach and play, but still highly strategic. So do you have a bunch of Sanctum cards in play, but a handful of untamed cards? Which do you declare? Your deck composition, luck of the draw, and game flow all factor into your decisions. Now, let's go through a few sample rounds to see how Keyforge actually plays. Alright, so right now I've set up a game between uh, the two starter decks for non-spoilery purposes, Radiant Argus the Supreme and Miss Onyx Censarius. Uh, the first player will draw seven cards, which is Radiant Argus. By the way, every deck has a unique name also, and some of them are hilarious. <laughs> this is not the most hilarious, but my best one that I've got, I've got some that's doc the Doctor of Junk Frame, Lavar, the Abstractedly Three-Eyed, Whispers of the Companion Stairs Tunnel, my personal favorite, however, the Energetically Conspicuous Winston. Anyway, back to the game. First player draws seven cards and only plays one card. We still have to declare our active house. We're going to declare Logos and play the Library of Babel because it's an artifact card, and that is a good one to get out early. So I've turned the decks this way, but obviously they're going head-to-head -head this way, just so you can see. So there is our artifact right there. And then I've already got my six, so I don't draw any cards. Now it is Miss Onyx's turn. Who gets to play one card to start with? We could destroy uh, a creature. They don't have a creature. Return enemy. Oh, man, this is... By the way, uh, Miss Onyx has Brobnar, Dece, and Shadows. Uh, Radiant Argus the Supreme has Logo, Sanctum, and Untamed. And all the decks, uh, the factions, you can pretty much um, follow parallels to various, like, Magic the Gathering colors or factions from other CCGs. They are very similar. Untamed is usually pretty green. Uh, Sanctum is white. Uh, D black is probably a combination of decent shadows and then red Brobnar. You know, you can make these parallels pretty easily, but there are obviously some unique uh, differences as well. Uh, the Dust Imp is a good one to throw out there because if it gets destroyed, we gain two amber, which is definitely great. So we're going to throw that Dust. We're going to declare uh, Dece and throw the Dust Imp out there. And then that was six cards for uh, one card from us, so we draw a card, and now the game really begins normally, where you declare one house and you can play all the cards from that house. So right now, even though we've got a Logos card out there that allows us to draw a card, I believe, as an action, which is great. If we declared Logos, we'd only actually play one card, and we gain one amber for each forged key your opponent has for Des Dr. Escatera opponent doesn't have any forged keys, so it wouldn't probably be a great move right now. Whereas if we played uh, Sanctum, we could get a bunch of these people out right now, which would be great. So we are going to declare Sanctum as our active house. We are going to play Lady Maxina, because when she is played, you can stun a creature. So we could place a stun status card on that creature, which you'd think I would have uh, prepared. 
And again, I really wish these were tokens, but that's okay. So we have stun to the dust imp, which means our opponent cannot use as an action. They just have to remove that stun effect. Now Lady Maxina does come into play essentially exhausted or tapped for Magic the Gathering terms. So I can't use her this turn. Let's see if we're facing this way, then I'm tapping her this way. <laughs> um, we could also summon the Raiding Knight. The Raiding Knight lets you capture an Amber, which unfortunately our opponent has not actually generated any amber, so we could keep Raiding Knight in our hand, but we're going to go ahead and play them because I find it's pretty good to just play our cards as we get them. Cleansing Wave lets us heal, which generates amber for healing. We don't we don't have any damage. Uh, the Hallowed Blaster is an artifact, however, that stays on the board and can heal every action, so we're going to play that as an artifact. Getting our artifacts out early is pretty dang good. And that's our whole turn because we couldn't use our Library of Babel because we did not declare Logos, we declared Sanctum. So we draw up to six, three... Let's see, where are we at? Five, six. All right, we've definitely got some difficult options next turn. Miss Onyx, for their first turn, uh, they could definitely declare Dees because they'd be able to uh, play a number of cards, destroying a creature straight up that is not on a flank. Unfortunately, both these creatures are technically on the flank because there's only two creatures there, so we couldn't actually use our hand of Dees yet. Toxin, your opponent discards a random card from their hand. It's actually a creature, that's its reap ability. Um, I'm thinking, or we could stun one of their creatures with our one Brobnar card, but if we use Dees, then we can at least unstun uh, our Dust Imp. We also got another Dust Imp out there. So let's go ahead and declare Dees. So we can do things in any order on our turn in terms of playing cards, and there's no cost. So really you just choose what you wanna play and go for it. So we can play this uh, other Dust Imp uh, we can go ahead and summon the Urchin, which when we play them, we steal an Amber. Unfortunately, our opponent also did not generate any Amber. Uh, we can't play Hand of Dees. We could, if we wanted to, play it and just generate the Amber, but none of our cards actually have the Amber symbol, so they don't generate any Amber for us. In fact, this Dees Shadows deck is all about stealing opponent's Amber more than creating our own Amber. We could return an enemy creature to its owner's hand. Unfortunately, Maxina actually likes doing that because every time she pops back down, she can stun a creature. So we don't want to return that one. We're going to go ahead and put Toxin out, and we will use Fear on the Raiding Knight. So that uh, is a discard, and that puts this card back into our opponent's hand. Now, we can use Dust Imp, but its action, all it does is get rid of this stun. So it's still stunned, unfortunately. Sorry, Dust Imp, but we're prepped pretty well now. All right, so we're drawing up to our hand. Three, four, five, six. And you can see already you've got a good deck building engine without having to have any of those draw cards because you're playing a lot of cards every turn, ideally, and you're drawing a lot of cards. So it really keeps the action moving very, very quickly, which I like. Hey, we finally got a card that actually generates Amber on its own. Let's see how Radiant Argus responds. So right now, the only creature available is the uh, Sanctum Creature Lady Maxina, who has an action, can just pop back into our hand, and then we could play her again to stun a creature, which that's actually a great ability to be able to stun opponent's creatures. Um, we need to be able to wipe some of our opponent's creatures off the board. I don't know if we have good options from that, though we could play some Logos, which would allow us to draw another card. I don't like Dr. Escatera this late, but you don't want to keep too many cards in your hand Ooh, refill your hand when I discard. All right, we're going to declare Logos. For our first action, we're going to um, use our Library of Babel, which allows us to draw a card as an action, so that's one time. Unfortunately, it was not a Logos card, but we can put down Mother, who just says during our draw card step, we can refill our hand to one additional card. And we'll go ahead and play Dr. Escatera, whose ability unfortunately doesn't go off. But right now, we're just getting out some cards. Hopefully, I can show off a battle soon. Now, we are at six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So normally, we could not draw a card. But Mother's ability states that we can refill our hand to one additional card while Mother is on the board. So we'll draw another card at the end. And unfortunately, this was the end of our turn, so we can't actually play that card. All right. Now we've got options. Miss Onyx and Sarius has some serious options here. Boom, boom, all these creatures become available. Whoops, I just realized this was not a Dees creature. This is Urchin, <laughs> my bad. That was a Shadows creature. You're coming back to my hand. Um, ooh, that's great. If your opponent has no Amber, gain two Amber. We want to declare Dees definitely, because we got all these creatures here too. So we're going to play the Terror, which is at play. Your opponent has no Amber, you gain two Amber. 
So Onyx uh, generates two amber just from that, which is fantastic. Uh, Schuler would not help us. Hand of Dece, we could destroy a creature not on a flank. So Hand of Dece destroys Mother, because Mother is not on the flank. She's in the middle. Sorry, Mother. Um, and we could play Schuler if we wanted to. We probably would. Uh, we would probably just reap with all these creatures. This one just came out, but we could just reap instead of attack. And that means we generate three amber, one for each. Now, if I wanted to attack, I could. You would just declare the attacker against the defender. Both of them uh, get rid of their power at the same time. But none of mine are actually as strong as their opponents, so I'm going to keep uh, my advantage of numbers in play and just generate more amber. So right now I've got five amber on my side. And then I could even summon another creature. Radiant Argus is looking like they're in trouble this turn. But you can kind of see an example of how it plays. It goes very, very quickly. You can play whatever cards that you like. Uh, it's just back and forth. You try and keep creatures under control, but your ultimate goal is not necessarily to fight each other, but to generate the most amber by the end. You need seven amber at the beginning of your turn to generate to forge a key, and the first to three key keys wins. All right, let's go over my quick pros and cons for Key Forge Call of the Archons. Pro, no more booster packs. Yes, you're still technically buying random cards, this time at $10 a pop, but every deck is playable right out of the gate. Some you may not enjoy as much as others, but after opening over half a dozen packs, I've yet to come across a total stinker. Pro, no resource limitation beyond the cards themselves. The active house system works amazing, and it practically eliminates resource costs while still giving you tough choices to make every single turn. Pro, Engine building rather than attacking. In Keyforge, you're not trying to kill your opponent. You're trying to build something faster than they can. It will almost certainly involve lots of creatures attacking each other in battles and warfare, but it helps that the core gameplay stands out even further compared to other CCGs. Con, paying $10 for an entire deck can sting when you end up with factions you don't enjoy or a deck that doesn't sync up with the way you like to play. Well, I think Keyforge fixes a lot of the inherent CCG issues, it doesn't eliminate them entirely. Con, non-reusable deck boxes. I can't believe a game that's all about purchasing new decks of cards doesn't include reusable tuck boxes. Once you open a deck, you're forced to purchase a tuck box or rely on the dreaded rubber bands. Really inexcusable. Final verdict. I remember when Magic the Gathering was a brand new game and everyone was playing it. I played it throughout the 90s, but eventually fell off. I dabbled in a lot of other CCGs over the years with very few capturing my interest that long. Although, shout out to Dice Masters for being really fantastic, fun, and different also. But at this point, I'm prepared to declare Keyforge the best CCG since Magic, with the caveat that it's technically not really a pure CCG, sort of. The deck system is way more consumer-friendly than building uh, your own deck through the luck of booster packs, and I adore the resource-less active house engine-building gameplay. The true test will be if Keyforge can prosper amongst a very crowded admittedly expensive genre, but I'm definitely rooting for it. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can enjoy more videos, reviews, and live plays of board games, video games, and tabletop RPGs here on my YouTube channel, as well as my website at roguewatson.com, and you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Thank you.